Hey, hey everybody, uh, welcome back. Uh, thanks for checking out the last video on Mille Lacs. I am super excited and kind of amazed that I got these three people uh, all together uh, to do this, but, uh, and none of them really need any introduction, but I got uh, Gre Greg Thomas, musky fishing extraordinaire guide, owner of Musky Hunter Magazine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Lee Talkin, Mr. Today's Angler, YouTuber, former Mille Lacs guide, uh, and Luke Ronestrand, Mr. Big Time Vermilion guide, uh, musky insider instructor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, anyway, these guys are, you three guys are just people I, I respect a lot. Um, you've all been doing this a really long time. And I got these guys together um, because all three of them were, were guiding and kind of the premier guides on Lake Mille Lacs um, in, back in the glory days. I guided there, but I actually missed the best years of Mille Lacs. I, I had switched over to Vermilion and kind of fallen in love with that. Um, so I came to visit a few times and got a little taste, but not like these guys. And um, when I did that last video on the stocking of Mille Lacs, what I realized um, from the comments and just a lot of feedback from people is one, uh, a lot of people really just don't or uh, realize or didn't realize how amazing the fishing was when that lake was on back in the heyday. And then also a lot of people didn't realize like how drastic of a difference it was to, you know, from that to when it fell off. And so you guys were all there. And so I want you guys to um, share a story and maybe we'll just go, we'll go around the horn um, Luke, maybe we'll start with you. Hopefully you guys aren't seeing this little thing that just popped up on my screen, but I'm gonna exit off. Um, and then we'll go to Lee and then Greg. And uh, what I wanna start with is just uh, if uh, it, it could be, it could be a best day on the water for big fish or numbers, or it could just be a, a story, right? About maybe a, a, a bunch of boats out at the same time that caught a bunch of fish, but just any kind of a story that you can think of that kind of encapsulates like how amazing that fishery was uh, when it when it was on out there back in the heyday. So, so Luke, why don't we start with you? Um, can I can I share like there's like kind of when you when I read the email with this question, there's three things that like three kind of time periods that really stood out, um, and uh, just I would say the like the most amazing day that I ever had out there. It was in the fall, um, like 2006. And uh, we caught seven muskies that day. And then three of them were over 50. And then like the three 50 inchers all had really tremendous girths. And uh, like that was, that's the day that stands out as like, you know, like my best day of musky fishing ever. But then um, one of the coolest things that ever happened and they weren't, um, they weren't the biggest fish, but it just, you have to like, the, like it's just the, to think about it is I had a one guest that caught seven muskies and seven casts <laughs> like wow. straight like they were all carbon <laughs> like cookie cutter 44 to 46 inches but uh -huh. he literally caught seven muskies and seven casts yeah that's and crazy. then and then in, another time period that really stands out is just something that I I don't think you know in, in Minnesota um unfortunately we'll ever be able to experience is it and this was everybody I believe was involved, Lee and Greg and, and Jason Hammernick, but we had like a, a stretch, um, the end of August, I want to say maybe in like 2007, where it was like every night you got double digits or close to double digit muskies. So like seven to 11 muskies a night mm -hmm. for us. And then I want to say that Jason Hammernick at, so we went to Canada but then he ended up catching like 42 muskies over Labor Day weekend. I mean, just, you know, not all of them were giants. You know, a lot of them, I mm -hmm. want to say, were, you know, like low to mid 40s, just a couple 50 inches mixed in. But think about that, 42 muskies. Like, that's, that's like legitimately like half of us, half the season now, you know, right. for like, <laughs> right. For, for my, like, like literally, I mean, it's just, it's incredible to think, and that would be like one weekend and then like one week where you're catching 50 muskies. It's just, it's just unbelievable to think about. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Thanks. Those are, those are, those are really amazing. Uh, Lee, why don't, why don't we jump to you? 
Um, one thing that stands out to me is especially when the night bite was going and, uh, you know, people called us the vampires out there, you know, um, but it was literally so good some nights. It was like you'd ask your, your customers or whatever, uh, do you want to make another pass or you want to catch a couple more? Or you want to go in? No, <laughs> let's go in. I've caught enough. <laughs> I kid you not. It was like that. It really was like that. When it was going, obviously, we had days where we caught nothing as well. I mean, mm -hmm. just any musky lake. Um, so that's one thing that stuck out to me. And I know, Josh, when we were filming a Next Bite episode one night, we were trying to reshoot something, and you were casting, and we kept catching them and couldn't reenact this stupid thing we were reenacting. And I just remember they just get biting. Yeah. so it's funny you say that because it's kind of a segue I wasn't really going to talk but I'm like if I was this is the story that I would have to share is I remember that because I was guiding on Vermilion you were on Mille Lacs and we we both left because we were supposed to film a show with Gary Parsons for the next bite and yeah. we went to Wisconsin to I think it was the turtle flambeau floage right. and so yeah. we were gone a bunch of your buddies were staying at your place yeah and blowing up your phone the entire time that we are on the turtle flambeau flowage not catching fish and you were just like we're you know like dude this is the, you were just going crazy and finally gary was like well if they're biting that good i mean we could just go there and like that boat was on plane and that boat was on the trailer so fast going over there and and, and for me like you were, you like kind of knew like that this is what it was right but but for me that was like my like just eye-opening experience because I, 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 and I think it was in that same Labor Day period that, that Luke was yeah. talking about when we were there, sure. right? When Jason was catching all those fish. Um, because yeah, I just remember it got dark out and it was just like, literally you'd catch one and it was almost like sunfish. But the thing that was driving me nuts is we were filming this TV show yeah. and uh, you know, this is probably gonna ruin things for some people, but a lot of times, especially back then you only had one camera, right? So you would catch the fish and let it go like normal. But then, you know, they, you had to build the other stuff in, like if the cameraman didn't get the hook set or the net job or whatever, you kind of have to, to do some reenacting of all that, right? And once the fish is gone and swam away so they can put together and it looks nice. So we're doing that and we can just see like headlamps going on like everywhere, like fireworks. I mean, everybody's just catching them like crazy. And I remember looking at the camera guy, like, dude, can we do this later? Like they're, they're biting, you know? And he's like, no, no, we got to, this is best practice, you know, someone's shirt could get wet or something and then you won't have continuity and blah, blah, blah. But I remember I was just going insane and I think we still ended up catching like, I don't know, like eight or nine fish or something like that that night. And, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and then the other thing I remember is throwing a tantrum at the end because like Gary and the camera guy wanted to go in and I was kind of like, dude, we oh, just got yeah. one, they're still biting and I wanted to keep, you know, go stay in. out and, uh, but it wasn't my boat, so I got dragged off the water uh, against my will. So, but yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. So, um, I'm gonna. Did you have anything else to add, or should I jump to Greg here? Um, I, I just wanted to say the the two best uh, days that we ever had, or one was a night actually. Uh, we had nine fish in the boat, five of which were 45 to 49 and a half, mm -hmm. and four of which, uh, two of them were. Uh, like 50 and a half to 51. Then there was a 53 and a half and a 54 and a half. All in the, in the four over 50 were in the same uh, two hour period. And we lost two more that were for sure over 50. We saw them and had them come off. So we could have, could have potentially had six over 50 in less than two hours. Wow. Crazy so, stuff. That's, I mean, that's just the way that place was. It was, um, yeah, I mean, I think in the lower 48, there'll never be another place like that. I no mean, way. with the numbers, I think, you know, you got other fisheries that got the big fish in them and stuff, and you'll get them, but they're not going to come the way Mille Lacs did. You know, I, I got on Mille Lacs in 2000, was it 2001, Luke? I think yep. I came up there. And um, there was, uh, you know, kind of watched a lot of those fish grow up. You know, when I first got there, you seen a lot of 46 to 48 inches. There really wasn't a lot of 50 inches being caught, if I remember right, uh, in the early 2000s. There were some. I mean, there was mm -hmm. some big ones. I think Jason got that um, super ridiculous one that was at 50 by 29 or something like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, early 
uh, early like that. But there wasn't a, a ton of those super giants. And then in 2002, you know, you started seeing uh, more fish clipping that 49 to, to 50 inch range. And then from like 2003 to 2007 is when it was really just, it, it just got crazy. And then once the night fishing started, because um, it used to be, and it, it, you know, and, and Luke, you remember this, used to be once it got dark, all the boats headed in. Mm -hmm. you know, and it was just dumb. I mean, mm -hmm. you could literally um, go through there and I know Fritzy did it one night. He went through there and just iconed in the wish, drove through the weeds and spotted three big fish, put an icon on them, went back and made three casts and caught all three of them. <laughs> yeah. they, were all, they were all over 50. Um, you know, they were just, you know, they were dumb and uh, my kind of fish. And, you know, I think the best, you know, one of the better times I had out there, we got, we got a 50 and a half, a 53 and a 51 and four cast um off the same reef uh one night um we got um there were several you know at least five nights we boated three fish over 50 um which is just dumb numbers my biggest fish is still out there uh 56 and a half um out of malax and uh it, it just what was amazing is you could go up to the sand on the north end in 2000, from 2001, when I first got there to 2006, and you could just, just drive through it, not making a cat, and you just point them out to people. Oh, there's one, there's two, there's six over there. Um, and just, you would see in a normal day, if you just wanted to show people fish, you could take them up there and show them 25, 50, 60 fish, no problem. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times those fish didn't bite. Sometimes they did. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and it just, it was amazing. And, and, and it wasn't like you had to be that good. If you could reel yeah. at night, yes. you could catch them. You didn't have to jerk. You didn't have to set the hook. You yeah. just reeled. Yeah. I, mean, I had more women catch really big fish with me after dark out there. Yeah. The first time musky fishing than yeah. anywhere. And it was mostly, it all started the same way. I'm hung. Uh, no, you're not hung. Yeah. Uh, and it was, a uh, you know some giant fish out there because um, they were swallowing baits and and everything and and even at night you were just following you know guys would uh, uh you know taking pictures you, you got to the point where just taking a picture of a fish was uh you didn't want to take unless it was a really big one because you knew somebody was going to follow the flash somebody was going to chase <laughs> down because they was, oh they're catching them over there uh so it was uh yeah, I mean, it, it just the, – the sheer number of big fish, um, I don't think will ever be – and the sheer number of, like, the fall fish, these huge, girthy, big fish that that, that were being caught. And, you know, it, it, I'm sure the Minnesota state record's been broke a dozen times out of Mille Lacs. Mm -hmm. um, it's just never been – nobody's waited. Mm -hmm. um, there's just been some huge, huge fish caught there, and no one's ever really taken uh, – taking the time to it but um yeah it's just it's it's sad it's 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 i don't even know if you can say it's a shell of what it was it's a it's a it's, yeah and so that kind of segues into the next thing that i wanted to ask you guys about because i know that you were all there um when it went bad right it went from all those amazing stories that you guys just told us about to you know being very very you know difficult and um, I, I, I will just go in the same order and we can go back through, but um, tell me a little bit about like what that, what that felt like uh, for you to be like, maybe like emotionally, business-wise, fishing-wise, whatever, right? Like all those things. And, um, you know, how long you stayed and, and dealt with that till you, you finally decided that you, you just, you had to, to leave. Well, I, I would say that I thought and that the fishing really changed in 2008 mm -hmm. um, is when things like really started to change out there. And then I would say, um, you know, I started fishing there less. And so 2008 was kind of my last kind of semi full time year there. And then 2009, um, I spent a, a little bit less time. And then by 2010, it was just very 
you know, like I would only go there if somebody that I had fished with a lot and, you know, really wanted to fish there. Like I almost had to have my arm twisted to go and fish there. And then by, I would say 2012, I, I wouldn't even entertain the idea of doing a, a summertime trip out there anymore. And, um, I, I left Mille Lacs and, um, you know, I was, I was guiding when I started guiding, I was guiding Mille Lacs and Vermilion. And then, um, I basically just kind of filled in the Mille Lacs trips with doing some stuff out in, uh, in Western Minnesota and West in, um, like West battle and, and Miltona, Brad Hoppy adopted a few of us and, and took us in out there. Um, and then in 2011, I just, I made Vermilion my, uh, my full-time lake, but my wife and I bought our house in Elk River because of its proximity to Mille Lacs. You know, like I, we literally, we chose where we live because of, of Lake Mille Lacs. And I mean, I never had any, any plans of ever leaving there. And like, I'll, I'll still never forget the, like the moment that I went out of Max Twin Bay and like you know, like 2002 or three and was just like, how I just, I got to figure out a way to, to get out here and be out here every day just because of what a, an amazing place it is. And, um, it's just, it's one of those things. Like I, I don't, I don't even know how to describe the way that it feels having something like that, that taken, you know, like having it just taken for you from you where it just, it, it doesn't exist. And when you go out there and you, you fish again, you're just like, Oh, well, you know, like, it's a really big deal if we just catch one, like just like just the catch a muskie. But then, I mean, it to me, I, I still went out there and, and played around in the late fall. Um, but the, when that lake really fell off for me in the late fall, I mean, it got progressively harder. But like from from 2015 to 2016 went from like, you know, like I, I expected to catch one every day but then if it didn't happen like you were bummed out and then like you could go a couple days and be like oh we're gonna catch one eventually to like in 2016 I was out there and like am I ever gonna catch another one of these things <laughs> and it's just it's just not a it's just not a good feeling yeah uh and, and Lee I'm gonna jump to you and since Luke kind of got ahead a little bit so you you can just add this in too once you talk about uh how it felt and how long you stayed before you left. Um, maybe you can share also like where you ended up going to like once, once you left too. Well, <clears throat> let me say too, uh, it was 2008 as well. And the one thing that I've always thought about why uh, a potential reason why it was such like a brick wall where it just like almost ended, you know, abrupt, so abruptly is that's the year that we, uh, um, had that high water. And mm -hmm. I honestly think a lot of the fish swam out of that lake. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously a lot of fish died, mm -hmm. delayed mortality, this, that, and the other, they got mm -hmm. smart. They started using open water more. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one thing that happened that year was the highest water they had had on that lake for a very long time from mm -hmm. what the locals had told me. So I don't know, one thing I just wanted to look at. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it was quite abrupt. Um, you know, and for myself, you know, being from Wisconsin, I, you know, I had to rent a place to stay for, you know, uh, five months at a time and, you know, pretty much, you know, change my life. And that's, that was the thing. I'm like, I got, I have to go to this lake because this has the biggest fish that you can go catch casting and I have to go do this. And now where are they? They're gone. So basically 2008, I started branching out, fishing up more at Leech and Cass and Bemidji area and those mm -hmm. lakes and uh, you know I've, and it was fruitful as well up there mm -hmm. so it just seemed like you didn't have that hard wall crash like you did at Mille Lacs mm -hmm. or whatever the reason was uh, does anyone know I don't know the uh, uh, the same I'll, I'll agree with you there Lee the, and Luke the 2008 was just a weird um you know, I've seen lakes go through little peaks and valleys, but that was just stupid. I mean, yeah. they, those fish just, you'd go to regular spots. And not, not only that, you just couldn't see them. I mean, you just couldn't go up to the sand and see them laying there. I mean, every year before that, you could see these fish. And I don't think they're going to change their entire, something they'd done forever oh. um, until all of a sudden they're nowhere. You know, you'll see one up there, two up there. Um, 
and they disappeared. And, and something, Josh, I, we'd talked about before we got on here is, and I'm sure these guys can agree with me here, is the resorts and the bars and the restaurants up there. Yeah. I mean, they took an absolute bath when this thing happened because um, restaurants you know, were burning down. They, yes, there, was, <laughs> there were some fires. They had some, uh, they had some fire. Well, you can't start a flood. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, I mean, it's just the money that the muskies were bringing into Mille Lacs, and it's a Mille Lacs is a super blue collar area. It's not a, a ritzy area at all in the state for guys that don't know. In Minnesota, it's not a real um, high dollar area. It's very blue collar, and it was bringing, I mean, what few bait stores there were were selling tons of baits. And if you're selling musky baits, you're selling, you know, there's a decent margin on that for the stores. Um, and then the bars were always, uh, and restaurants had people coming to them, your resorts. I mean, the Red Door, I mean, it, I mean that, that kept that place afloat. Uh, well, remember for, the, the big expansion that they did after like 2007? Yeah. I mean, they added, yeah. I mean, they had oh. added like 50% more capacity between cabins oh, yeah, they, and they got a rid hotel. Of all, their, uh, all their fish houses and they yeah, built they, cabins. Yeah, they, <laughs> built a, they built a restaurant. Yes. Wow. Yes. I mean, it, it, that place, and because it was, you know, that was kind of the centralized, easy location, kind of right where you could put in. And, and, you know, a lot of those places up there, um, I don't even know how they're doing. If half of them are still in existence, I, I couldn't tell you, um, you know, economically that place just got absolutely killed. I'm sure the smallmouth and the walleye and, and the, uh, uh, the pike are doing some good up there but the one thing is that musky fishermen no matter where you're at no matter he asks they're spending money i mean Lots they're gonna be, they're the guys that are yeah they're buying baits they're buying rods and bigger boats and and all this stuff and i just think that's really you know i don't i don't have an explanation on why i think the fish aren't there i just know that they're not um and it seems like it's getting definitely worse um the fall you know, I keep, I talk to guys out there that fish it in the fall and, you know, and it's like, you know, day 13, we might've seen one. Um, <laughs> well, like, like no little... joke, a, a really good weekend in the fall. Cause I do the same. I talk to guys out there, like a really good weekend. There'll be 40 boats out there fishing and like three muskies getting caught is a really good weekend. Like, yeah. that's like a banner day. If there's like a day where three of them get caught, like, that's the day that they were biting. Yeah. Right. Out of 40 bullets. Yeah. And it, it you know, and, and it, you know, the, the, the pressure out there, I mean, you can blame it on pressure. You can do whatever. I, I don't, I don't blame it on pressure. I mean, there, there no. was a lot of fish. I'm sure there was a lot of fish that had delayed mortality because that lake produced, God, how many people's biggest fish? I mean, that, that, you know, and, and you catch your biggest fish, you want to, you know, you take plenty of pictures and blah, 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 that happens. But, you know, I'm sure that was one of the issues. I'm sure, um, you know, a lot of those fish were dumb and they were taking baits really deep, um, which was another issue, but that's still, it, you know, it, you would have thought the fishery would have survived, um, survived better than that. And, you know, I don't know if this is something we want to mention, but I mean, the, the, you didn't see many smaller fish, mm -hmm. right? Right. Not till 2008. And my, I started to see 38 inchers on spots that you would only catch 48, 50 plus, you know, that's the one thing I remember. Yeah. And that's, you know, you just didn't see, and you know, you were, it was kind of like the fish just classed themselves out, you mm -hmm. know, that, that they weren't more coming up. Right. into that um, well, group one just... one crazy thing that happened while we were all there is i mean there was a moratorium on musky stocking so from like 2000 to 2004 there was zero musky stocked and then after 2004 it went to the 3000 muskies every other year so like we literally watched that the initial year classes and that initial 12 14 years, whatever it was of, of like adequate musky stocking numbers, ramp up and build that, you know, build, we watched those fish grow up and then there was nothing after that. And that's, you know, like we just, we lived through that. Like we watched that whole, 
that whole peak and valley of that stocking curve. Like that's, that's what happened. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, by the way, I'll put, I'll add a link in the description of this video, just in case anyone didn't see it. Um, the, the kind of preceding video to this is I did go through a lot of the stocking data and we even created a few population models based on, you know, the stocking. And, and interestingly enough, you know, those models basically show a huge crash happening in 2008 and just a lot less fish being in the system. So, so the math kind of does add up that way when you add in the high water scenario that Lee talked about. And also, I mean, one thing I do remember uh, on the lake that year is it did seem like, and you guys were there way more than me. So you can, it's okay if you don't agree with this, just tell me you're not gonna hurt my feelings. But I mean, I just, cause I just remember being there for that tournament that year. And, and one, one thing I just remember was, cause I had been on Vermilion is just one, how dejected like everybody was who was there uh, and had been fishing there. Like I remember we were having a rules meeting for the tournament and um, Paul Hartman decided that, you know, if there was wind or whatever, you could drive in your car, you know, to your takeoff. Like we had to start in an area to get your number, but then you could drive your truck like up to the North end if you wanted to, instead of like driving in your boat through the waves. And so I remember like Jeff, at the rules meeting, he's like, well, can, can we run like to our truck? Cause you know, Jeff's like really competitive and he's like thinking, you know, he can get ahead of a few people and get the truck right and on the road or whatever to get up there. And I remember Hammernick was standing next to him and he just looked at him. He goes, it doesn't matter. He was just like, <laughs> he, it just seemed like he had this attitude, like none of us are going to catch anything. Of course, Jason ended up winning the tournament, catching one. And I believe there was one other fish caught in that tournament. I think there were two fish caught. Um, um, total. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's a memory I have of it. I, I kind of got off track that I for, forgot how that tied into what we were talking about, but. Uh. It, it was a, it was just a tough bite. I mean, everything that was, um, I don't know. I left probably 2008 is when I really quit. I mean, I, I headed West and you know, much like Lee, I'm from Kentucky. I lived out of a, I lived out of several places up there. Um, and uh, it was, you know, you got to figure out what you're going to do. You just couldn't stand there and, and, and tell guys, well, this used to be good. That, that's not, that's not going to get you anywhere. Um, so I left, I went West. Um, I kind of bounced around though. I did go up to Leech a little bit and kind of played around, but my main thing was out West. I went to Miltona West Battle and mm -hmm. uh, Detroit Lakes. And I still go to Detroit Lakes now for the fall. Mm -hmm. I spend, uh, what is this? I hopefully you're not seeing this. Uh, we're not. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, and, and so I went out west to Detroit Lakes and it was, um, you know, that was a, I was another, you know, luckily I've been able to watch two fisheries go really good and, mm -hmm. and those fisheries aren't as good as they used to be, but I mean, they're still got confidence that you're going to catch something. Uh, right. every day that you go out you're going to move some fish see some fish um, I'm now spending my summers at Lake St. Clair um, mainly because of a lot of my clients don't want to drive to Minnesota because um, I get a lot of Chicago customers and they you know St. Clair is four hours versus 10 hours and that, that's what I you know see that but you know it used to be with Mille Lacs, guys would they didn't mind driving that because they knew their shot at getting a, a giant fish was uh, definitely there. Right. And so one thing I just want to like reiterate, because basically all three of you, like, so Greg, you came all the way from Kentucky. Like yep. that's how amazing that fishery was. And, and, and I mean, dedicated your life to like moving, like picking up and moving and going to Minnesota because of it. Lee, you came from Wisconsin and Luke, you bought a house right? Like somewhere, like based on how, and how close it was to Mille Lacs. So that's like the dedication that you guys put in, right? And, and um, kind of what spurred like this video series to start was the DNR, you know, recently had made an announcement about Lake Mille Lacs and, and, and they put out a report that basically said, um, this is probably not ex ex the exact quote, but it was something along the lines of, um, musky fishermen are satisfied, satisfied with the status quo 
in the way the lake's being managed. So we're planning to continue on with the plan that we've been doing. So I'm assuming since all of you guys made those huge commitments to the lake and you all had to leave that you're not feeling satisfied. Would that be a, a, a safe assumption? Yeah, that's a, a very safe assumption. Yeah. <laughs> even, oh, regardless, just... <laughs> even regardless of what we think, just the grand scheme of tourism and the musky mm. dollars that were generated is astronomical. It'd be so hard to even oh. come up with a number. The, mm. Like circling way back to it in the, the beginning and talking about the amazing fishing that we had, like most people that spent time on Lake Mille Lacs experienced that. Like there are so many people that got to experience this like unbelievable world-class fishery and that, I mean, it's just, and just to have that be kind of like taken away, but then like, they don't even care that it's not that way anymore. It just, I, it's, it's just the most bizarre, strange, sad thing that I've, I've ever seen. It's just, I, I, I don't even, it's, it's unbelievable. And how many people, you know, and, and Luke, you can, you live there in Minnesota, you'll know you better than me going through Thorn Brothers, you know, how many people that fished Mille Lacs or started fishing Mille Lacs, I mean, don't even fish anymore? Oh, it, you know, so many. I, yeah. I, it's, yeah. I've had 50, like 50% 50 of my old customers at Thorn Brothers now fish bass or walleyes. And then some of them oh. don't even, some of them don't even fish anymore. Um, well, how many it's people, a, go ahead. I was just saying, it's just, it's amazing how, um, I, I was just totally lost my train of thought there, but it's just amazing how many people like that, like that was their musky fishing. And when, it, when they went away, it went away, they just, they just quit. quit. And, and how many people, you know, I know a couple guys that bought places on Mille Lacs. They bought houses yep. just because they fished up there and, and it was so good. And, and, you know, that people actually went and bought property on the lake um because it was so good and then it just it's not so good yeah and I, I do think there's there's a bigger story to tell of, of kind of what what happened to our fisheries in minnesota but you know in my opinion it all kind of started with Mille Lacs. that was mm -hmm. the the first domino to fall and it was you know such a big lake um, they could swallow up so many musky boats with all that acreage, right? That when, when it died, and you guys just kind of demonstrated too, right? You guys, you stayed in Minnesota, but you, you, we all had to disperse and go other places, right? And uh, while I wasn't guiding on, on Mille Lacs when that crash happened, I certainly felt it on Vermilion and Minnetonka because, I mean, the, the fishing pressure probably like I don't know, was like a 4X, 5X type of thing. I mean, it was just insane how many more boats showed up. Um, and, and so uh, I think I'm going to wrap this up because I don't want to make it too long, but um, I'm, I'm planning on following this up with another video. Where I think the next lake I'll probably look at is Lake Vermilion um, and look at some of the mathematics and the stocking of that and kind of talk about what happened there. Um, but, but before we, uh, we sign off here, do you guys have anything else you wanted to add? Um. You know, there's, you know, these lakes are, you know, to keep them going, especially lakes that were stocked, you got to keep putting them in there. You yep. know, I, I yeah. grew up on a stock fishery in Kentucky, and if we don't keep putting them in here, um, we know have them. And we're going through a little lull right now because the hatchery had a couple of down years in stocking, and I, you can tell it right now. We're, we're not producing the fish that we were, you know, three years ago. Now, it'll come back but you got to put them in for them to come back. Yeah. Well, I, the thing I, I appreciate about you doing this is I, I do think that there's a, I don't think that very many people understand how good Mille Lacs is compared to um, what it is now. I mean, like, I honestly think back, you know, back in the day, I mean, we, in our, in our summers, in our fall, I mean, we were touching, all of us were probably touching somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 200 muskies um, during that time period. And now if, if I knew a guide that was fishing out on Mille Lacs, you know, for an entire season and catching like 25 muskies a year, I would think he was an absolute freaking hammer. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and just a, I mean, I just, I, I just, I mean, is how far 
just how far it's fallen. I and just I don't I don't think I don't think people on the or that live around the lake even understand. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, well, I mean, it's been a while. I mean, what is it? Thirteen years since it was good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, so you take a thirty-year-old. He was a thirty-year-old now. That's probably getting into musky fishing. He was seventeen then. He wouldn't even know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, wouldn't even know anything about it. It's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's un, un, unbelievable. And I, I think the whole stocking thing out there, I mean, there's just, there's so much water, you know, at 130 some thousand acres that, you know, when those numbers went down, I mean, it just is a lot of places for a, a few muskies to be. Tourism. Yes. I see, man. Yep. It's, you know, everybody talks about, you know, in Wisconsin, uh, Hayward being the world record musky place. And it's mm-hmm. just like, you can't even catch a 40 incher for crying out loud, you know, but so, I mean, Minnesota definitely has that uh, potential for the big fish, obviously, mm-hmm. and the biomass, everything is just so much bigger, but just the tourism dollars that generated for the entire state, it's just, mm-hmm. is astronomical. So, and the DNR, I think that's what you want to look at as well is, is, you know, is it worth putting those fish in? And if muskies, yeah, it's definitely worth it. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> yep. it, it wasn't. It wasn't like it was built off of these astronomical numbers of of muskies either. Right. I mean, it was like it was like five to seven thousand fish a year. I mean, that's that shouldn't be that hard to come up with, right? Yeah, we think, and we'll we'll look at some of that in future videos because I am going to kind of compare, uh, you know, just some of the bigger waters what they like the acreage that they account for. I mean, really, Vermilion and Mille Lacs combined are more acreage than all the rest of the stock lake combined, you know, combined in the state. So, uh, but when you look at like how few fish go into those two bodies or, or of all those acreages, right, compared to all the fish that go into the other ones, it kind of makes you, you know, wonder if we're trying to spread everybody out and bring a lot of people here, you know, what would be the best strategy? So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, man, I... It's it's hard when you get, when I got you guys here to just like all of a sudden stop talking because we could probably talk about all kinds of things. But uh, um, I, I was going to kind of try and wrap it up unless anybody has anything else they want to add. Well, I know the people that I fished with, uh, primarily from Wisconsin, aren't coming anymore mm-hmm. to Minnesota. Right. Yeah. By and large, by and large, the Vermilion they're still hitting, and you know, but. Definitely not like it used to be. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Well, well, hey, you guys, thank you so much for doing this. I'm, I'm uh, like really grateful, and, uh, and I hope everyone enjoyed watching this. Um, it's just a lot of great stories um, and, and really valuable insight into, you know, telling the story of Mille Lacs and what happened there. And, uh, you know, on the next one, I'll probably take a closer look at Vermilion. Um, thanks for joining us and you guys can go ahead and, uh, and sign off. All right. Thanks, thanks for Josh. Us. Thanks for having thanks, us. Everyone. Good to see you guys. You too. Too. Same to you guys. Hey everyone. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, be sure to hit the like button and the subscribe button, uh, on my channel. Uh, also in the description, I will include links, uh, so that you can find more information and content, uh, from Greg and Lee and Luke. Uh, Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next one.